Toronto, Ontario. More than 5.5 million people call Canada's largest metropolitan area home. One of the world's most culturally diverse cities, it is also home to one of North America's largest lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and queer communities. The neighborhood of Church and Wellesley, also simply known as The Village, has been the center of LGBTQ struggle, politics, and activism in Canada for decades. As a result of years of tireless advocacy, Canada has developed some of the most advanced LGBT rights in the world, including the country's first same-sex marriages in 2003. In the past 10 years, as the city has become more open to sexual diversity, the role of the church in Wellesley Village as a sanctuary for LGBTQ people has undoubtedly changed. With rising rents, a shifting social landscape, and the development of queer establishments outside the village, many Church Street businesses have recently closed their doors. Is there no longer a need for a queer neighborhood? Or queer spaces? Is the village dying? You know, this whole question of whether or not the, the queer village is dying, I think is just, I mean, I think that's too simplistic a question, and, and obviously there's a, a myriad answers there. Two years ago, I um, wrote a feature called Dawn of a New Gay, looking at the new generation of gay men, or I guess not new generation, um, but the next generation, and basically examining how growing up gay in the city affected me, what that meant, what it didn't mean, what social values were important to me, um, as well as some commentary on the state of the village. And, you know, I started going to the village when I was 14 in 2000. So over 10 years from then until the feature came out, I had witnessed a lot of changes. I was able to see um, how the village in many ways evolved and devolved. So... <coughs> All that lumped into 3,000 words created quite the conversation. In the time that I've been in Toronto, the village has taken on many forms and I think it's had many lives. I mean, certainly if you look at the past few decades, there have been a slew of gay-owned businesses alongside businesses that are not necessarily so. I mean, I think the most obvious change is, is all the chains coming in, all the multinationals coming in. Well, I mean, I think that, that I think we've all noticed over the last number of a couple of years anyway, that there's been uh, lots of change in the immediate neighborhood and lots of uh, 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 sort of transition between uh, businesses that have been in place for a number of years deciding to move off of off of Church Street. So the, the Glad Day Bookshop was, is the oldest surviving LGBT bookstore in the world, uh, has always been sort of a, a really important part of Toronto queer community and history. It's where people have gone to get their first gay magazine, their first gay book. The first gay porn. Yeah. Their first video, whatever, uh -huh. right? Um, <laughs> at a time when those kinds of things were not easily accessible in so many different places before the internet, before the corner store carried, you know, uh, gay porn or whatever. Uh, the Glad Day Bookshop was this the, the go-to destination for people, not just in Toronto, but people who came to Toronto. Every generation since the 70s, or every half generation, has kind of issued the one that preceded it, you know, I guess gay culture, whatever that means to people, um, it's different every decade. And the decade that I grew up observing it in the 90s suddenly became radically different in the 2000s. We uh, obviously social acceptance, marriage, um, all that kind of came into play that was only a hope an aspiration in the 90s and I think that really affected our culture you know the way we socialized the way we met each other what we found important and then when it came to growing up myself throughout the millennium I just found that it was a different game a whole bunch of independent bookstores 
have closed because it's hard for independent bookstores, hard for a lot of independent businesses these days in, in the era of mega stores to remain competitive. Uh, Glad Day was doing okay. Uh, it had one owner, it had an established client base, but it wasn't growing with, with, with the times. <clears throat> And mm -hmm. the, own, the owner had owned it for 43, 43 years. years. It was time to go. It was time for him it's to a go. Long, it's a long time to be doing some, the same thing. He was happy to, uh, to have us come forward because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. he didn't want to just sell it to anybody. He, he wanted to, sell, from my understanding, he wanted to sell it to somebody or a group of somebodies who actually wanted to do something with the business or he was happy to close it either way. So yeah, definitely Church Street is changing. Um, it's always evolving. This year, you know, unfortunately, the, the barn closed and Fab, which was one of our you know, great queer publications in the city, folded as well. Uh, so Fab has, had been around for almost 20 years and it was a gay scene magazine that covered the arts scene, the music scene, the club scene, social scene in Toronto and was very, just started by a bunch of gays like in the 90s just because they wanted a gossipy, fun, social um, rag. So uh, Fab closed down this year uh, in April 2013 and uh, without a lot of warning, uh, the publication just sort of ran out of money to be able to support the magazine. It's tough to run businesses in downtown Toronto too, right? And a lot of, I think we know from our experiences that there's lots of landlords in this neighborhood who aren't necessarily connected at the kind of uh, sort of community level. And, and so it's competitive businesses and um, it's tough sometimes to run those businesses and keep them open and vibrant. Um, and I think that the village has always had kind of a special feel for smaller organized, smaller businesses and smaller uh, kind of groups of folks that have, don't necessarily have the kind of significant financial backing to keep it, them open and vibrant and, and running effectively. Uh, it's changing for sure with the condos going around the village and threats of places like zippers closing and uh, fly closing, which they aren't officially as of yet. But you know, you have to look at the, the other side of things, you know, a new bar church on church opened up and there's a new publication that's going to be on its way. Hi, I'm Chris Kozak and I'm one of the creators of Church Bar in Toronto, um, which has been around for almost a year. Uh, and it's probably the most modern venue in our village here. I think that, unfortunately, the narrative of the village is definitely one of decline. And so I think that opening a new space when we chose to amidst a, a number of, of more prominent businesses closing uh, after a long period of time in most cases, I think that um, it's been difficult to try and capture the positivity that should come with opening a new business because so many people, I think, had diminished expectations of what a village experience should be like. In, in my experience, um, the village doesn't leave a lot of room for nuance. It's very labeled, defined, and people like that. But personally, I found it rather alienating and enslaving. To dismiss the village and to say it's not important and to say that there's no merit in having it is, is crazy. I think the Church in Wellesley Village is a nice idea. Um, I think it's a nice piece of history. So I think it, it's kind of time to move on. Well, I mean, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, queer, and two-spirited community in Toronto has for uh, many years, decades actually, have been advocating for a social acceptance and equality. Uh, much of our civil liberties and rights are now enshrined and codified in Canadian law. Uh, it is a, a criminal act to inflict hate on this community uh, based on who we are. And so that's, that's, uh, that's years of uh, accumulated effects, uh, and that's years of lobbying, and that's years of uh, blood, sweat, and tear passion uh, from the advocates uh, who ask for equality rights. And, uh, and as a byproduct of that, we now see that uh, LGBTQ people are able to travel very freely. We are able to live wherever we choose. It also means that the, uh, mo the mobility issue for us is that we no longer need to cluster together uh, in, the, um, in the ideal of, of safety. And I think, you know, there are a lot of kids who now grow up and, you know, there's, it's not the same struggle. Being gay is not the same struggle as it once was. And so finding gay specific spaces isn't as, por as important as it once was. I think that what we're seeing in the village is what we're seeing in many neighborhoods in the city, which is a, a, the gentrification, basically. 
and that um, small businesses throughout the city are under threat by rising rents, by big box stores. What's I think happening on Church Street is that we grew accustomed to seeing it as the gay village, the gay neighborhood, the ghetto, whatever. But the reality is that most of the properties on the street are actually not owned by queer folk. They're owned either by people not directly connected to this community, except for economic reasons, or by corporations. And so while we think of it as a community, others might be only thinking of it as a exploitation pool. Uh, my favorite little corner store uh, where I could buy everything has now halved itself and reduced its inventory. Um, I am now more often than not forced to go down the street to the mega store. Frankly, it comes down to economics and the gay village for most people in terms of rent is way too expensive. And, and that has a huge impact on the businesses that can open there and therefore the people that go to them. So I think we see a lot more sort of adventurous, non-mainstream culture um, in the, the further west or further east ends of the city. I live in Leslieville. Some people say Lesboville. I say old gay married coupledville or Pleasantville. Um, it's definitely a little village outside the city. Like you, when you live in Leslieville, there's like you're in a community and then there's a city there if you want it. We've always seen lots and lots of, you know, lesbians out in the East End and, you know, more and more gay men as well. And, you know, like, you know, always lots of, of talk about, you know, if you want to have a queer family, you're in the East End. And, you know, at, at this point, I'd say that's all around the city, thankfully. But there's a lot of queer people in the East End and we're seeing more and more nights out there, too. We're seeing nights like Toaster. We're seeing places like Whale Bar. Gay people have been living here for quite some time. Already. For 20 years, there was a lot of gay capital in this neighborhood was really gay friendly. I guess it was very close to downtown too. Where is the first really establishment for the bar business who really went upscale and created a bit of a dance atmosphere on a weekend? So I moved to Toronto, I was in London, England, and well, it's a much bigger city, but it was a gay place in every neighborhood you go in London, like everywhere. So it wasn't just Soho or some area, it was like everywhere you, you live. So I was to me to come in Toronto, the big city, why only Church Street? It just didn't make sense. So I live in Parkdale. Uh, Parkdale is uh, between King and Queen. Queen West is obviously a huge kind of uh, fun, hip area to, to live in. When I came to the city, there was loads of queer culture that was very much centered around Queen West. A lot of it, live music, a lot of it, of course, also uh, out of the art scene, visual arts scene, film in the city. And there's something that's developed on, on Queen West called queer Queen West or queer West. Um, and so there's lots of great spaces or parties that are thrown sort of in the West End. I worked at the Gladstone uh, for five years before I bought the Hen House two years ago. And right around that time, they had done a sort of revamp or renovation on the old existing hotel. The Drake had just opened up down the street. And within the same time frame, the Beaver was purchased uh, by Will. Uh, Will Monroe, a very well-known, obviously influential uh, queer artist in Toronto, whose long-standing parties um, really was sort of the start and his reason and uh, availability to be able to buy the beaver to begin with. Which seems to be the West End unofficial, official gay bar. Um, and there's a lot of parties that are thrown um, in, in areas in the West End, sort of away from the village. Uh, and it's really nice to have um, different spaces that aren't typically considered gay bars, but taken over by really successful gay parties. The vibe is just a little more, I guess, I guess queer, where it is a bit more of a mixed bag, where like I'd say like lesbians and gays and trans folks are all just hanging out in one big patio bar. Whereas in the village, it's a little more divided up into separate bars. So I think why people are drawn to sort of maybe going out in the West End of Toronto is because there are a ton of alternative nights here. Uh, you know, so there may be a French pop night or a dance hall and reggae night, or there could be, you know, something that's specifically for bearded men uh, and their, their followers and admirers. Um, and I think with Church Street, um, you know, maybe it's more, more of a traditional scene. Um, and so, and it could come down to just even little things like musical preference and style choice and the type of guy or woman that someone is attracted to. Um, and I think maybe 
Maybe Queer West in Toronto brings out a more alternative individual than a, a Church Street would. So I think maybe people are drawn to wanting to go out in the West End because of that. Some of the parties that I uh, DJ and promote and run in the city are Tapette, which is a French gay dance party that happens at the Hen House on Dundas West. Uh, Fit, which is this like gay house party for boys who like spandex that happens at the Beaver on Queen West. Uh, and also a DJ at Big Primpin, which is at Wrong Bar, also on Queen West. <laughs> so I've been throwing a party for about three and a half years, almost four years, called Business Woman Special, which is named after one of my favorite jokes in Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion. And, it, and it's in Kensington Market, which is really not a, you know, it's not a huge queer partying scene, but we throw it once a month and it really, it brings people from the West End and brings people from Church Street um, to sort of the middle of the city for a nice big queer party. With Fit specifically throw a party for village gays in the West End. So we're really trying to attract like the village type guy who might go to Fly or Buddies or uh, Woody's and bring them out to the West for like a West End adventure. There were some challenges getting started and getting the ball rolling in the West End. Um, we were very used to um, the comfort level of Church Street and throwing big gay fabulous parties. Um, we wanted to stay true to our brand and bring it out and branch out into different parts of the city. One of the biggest challenges that um, I think we've faced has been getting that, that staple part of Church Street that we do so well, if I say so myself, and bringing it to the West End and um, kind of broadening the horizons over on this part of town. Um, we've faced some challenges with that because usually the gay West End parties are usually more alternative. It's usually a different vibe, very hipster, which is cool too. But we wanted to bring something new and fresh here that's already happening across the city. It's been challenging to do so, but I feel like it's really catching on. I feel people are enjoying it. I feel people that do live in this area already and not having to travel so far to go and experience the whole church gay lifestyle, the fabulosity that is, that um, they're able to just come down over here and have the same experience, if not better. So we've only been open for a few months and uh, Pride TO is coming up, one of the biggest events in the city all year round. And we're very excited because it's our first Pride, obviously. So we wanted to go big, not go home. Um, so we, we booked Willem from RuPaul's Drag Race to come as one of our headlining nights. Um, the place was packed. It seemed like it was going very well. I was here all day working my ass off for a good reason. And it was, it was looking to shape up to be really great. And then we got the call that Willem's flight got canceled to a packed house. <laughs>you know, while there's always been at least one women's bar on Church Street, or almost always from, from the time I've been here, um, I would say that, that women, perhaps more so than gay men, have always been outside the village more so than in, in terms of looking at, at social stuff that goes on. And I think that's, again, because a lot of us live in the West End or further in the East End, and a lot of that comes down to economics. and. You know, I, you, you look at the migration and gentrification and, and the patterns of that in this city or any other, and where you have loads of artists and queer people, which often starts with gay women and so on, moving into neighborhoods because rent is affordable and so on, others will follow. It's unfortunate, uh, Slacks being one of the only places in the village, uh, its long history has been important to the village and it caters to a very specific crowd. Obviously being the primary ladies bar, it's also the place where it's like young girls and like 50 year old dykes are hanging out drinking martinis, you know. It was really special for what it meant but it is still so, so segregated from the rest of the neighborhood. The village is catering to a very specific crowd. Um, white, gay, male, not very alternative, not very queer, from what I could see. Although maybe that's changing now with the younger generation. Um, the village is not necessarily queer. And I think that my definition of queer, and everyone has a different definition, I think, of who they are and how they identify and what that actually means. But I think the L and the G and the B, not even the B, it's just really the L and the G are very representative uh, in that the lesbian and gays have their space and place within the village. And uh, the Q and the T and the rest of that acronym, the long alphabet soup that we now know is our sort of umbrella encompassing us are the ones 
ones that have less space in the village. I don't know. I mean, for me personally, I just I moved to Toronto about 10 years ago from Vancouver. And so I actually the first place I lived was on the Ryerson campus, just at Church and Gould, so like just south of the village. So I mean, my my first year in Toronto, that was kind of my scope of being of what being gay in Toronto was. And I never really felt comfortable there. Looking back, it was probably because it was very much a, a gay white male dominated neighborhood. And uh, that was just not something that I felt a part of, obviously. So um, you're a lesbro. Yes, some would say so. <laughs> Up until recently, really, there haven't been all that many clubs along Church Street that really um, left a lot of room for bringing in more mixed crowds because up until way too recently, gay men and lesbians were just not partying together or you know the whole mixed queer thing. Um, mixed nights, I will say this straight up, mixed nights um, for queer crowds and mixed nights where straight, our straight friends are welcome, all that sort of stuff, that has happened far more naturally outside of the gay village and I think that's because people did need to stake space, stake claim and so on. We're two-fifths of Yes Yes Y'all. Which is Canada's largest hip-hop and dance hall queer party. We always did have a mandate as to what we play at Yes Yes Y'all for sure. Um, being that hip-hop, R&B, dance hall, reggae, trap, anything that wouldn't ever be described as gay music typically because that sort of got really annoying to with the assumption that because we were a queer party, we had to play the circuit anthems or the top 40 hits. We had Yes Yes Y'all playing a stage at Pride a couple of years back. And as soon as we started, there was a group of your typical big uh, bear gay men. And uh, they obviously didn't like the music from the first song, which was a dance hall song, and immediately started to boo us and heckle us. And that continued for a couple songs. And I felt it was really unfair. We were at Pride. We're supposed to be full of positive energy, embracing things that are different from us. So I just went up to the group and I was asking why they were booing. And they told me that we should be playing game music. So of course, I wanted to elaborate on the conversation, being who I am. And I was like, what exactly do you mean by game music? And so they were like, you know, not this stuff. And it was like, oh, are you saying gay people can't like hip hop music? And they were like, no, we're not saying gay people can't like hip hop music. We're just saying there's stages for that. And it happened to be a Sunday and Black Rama was happening. And they're like, Black Rama is happening. So I was like, do you mean gay people can't like black music? And as soon as I said that, they backed off. You know, it's no uh, coincidence that, that The Beaver opened in Parkdale with Will and, and Lynn McNeil, um, both West Enders, and again, you know, coming down to where people live, or places like Hen House. This is the Hen House. It's a West End queer bar. Uh, it's five years uh, this year uh, we've been open and operating. I've been the owner for just shy of two years. And uh, I guess the concept behind the bar, uh, what was originally sort of brought into the West, was a girls' bar. Uh, when I took over, I really saw the need for an inclusive space that was beyond just being a lesbian bar or a girls' bar, quote unquote, and wanted to open it up to sort of everybody in the West. So we identify, I guess, as available space for all, uh, parties for boys, girls, trans folks, but we're also just a local bar. We knew that we wanted to keep it kind of in the midpoint of the city to make it accessible to both Church Street and sort of the West End queer scene and sort of try to bridge the two, the two scenes, I guess. Everything that you can possibly not imagine in your head and everything that you could possibly imagine in your head might just happen here. It's not just a guy party. It's not just a girl party. It's, we've kind of left it open-ended, so it's, Literally at the party, you can find anyone and everyone. I think what you get is a non-manufactured, non-cookie cutter version of what gay life looks like. We're not what's on TV. We are not what your parents see or what you view as being normal within the queer or gay community. I think that that's exactly why we're here. I was very against, I, I still am, the idea of ghettoization 
Um, I don't think it does anything um, to serve the cause other than to push ideals of marginalization upon us. We have to belong here, this is where we belong. I think the village evolved to serve a different purpose, a different function for people. Um, and I see it as a positive thing if there isn't one central hub. And I think the fact that we're creating more queer spaces all around the city, largely because we're creating more queer neighborhoods or people are just living where we're comfortable and can afford and so on, I mean, that can only be a good thing. I don't think that has to be painted as a, a uh, you know, a village versus the rest of the city. So as pockets of LGBT people start to move across the city, uh, you know, take up residency in Hyde Park or Riverdale or Queen West, Scarborough, Etobicoke or North York, that should be welcome and I think that we should champion that because we do not want to be segregated. We want to be fully integrated, but we also want to have a place to call our own when we need to. And, uh, and I think that there is a level of unfairness uh, to how the LGBT community constantly has to justify the, the existence of the village. And uh, because, you know, if LGBT people are so equal and free, then why do you have to come together? Queerness is, is a culture as well as a sexual orientation. LGBT people are asked to justify why should they have their own area where there's a kind of um, cultural familiarity, there's safety, there's the uh, sexuality, uh, there's history, where all those, all those elements that create a culture are there, are present, are respected, and are encouraged. Well, no one would dare ask me as a Chinese Canadian with intersecting identity, uh, you know, you do not need a Chinatown anymore uh, because you're free and you can live wherever you want and you can go wherever you want. Um, so I think it's just really grossly unfair that this question is constantly hoisted upon this particular community. Um, there are those who, uh, who may have expressed that, uh, that the church in Wellesley Village is in a state of decline or, or influx or renewal. Um, and I think that uh, that, that may be uh, in some ways a fair assessment, uh, although not a full complete assessment, uh, simply because uh, there isn't a residential or uh, commercial neighborhood, especially in downtown Toronto, that isn't in some uh, in the middle of some transition. The thing that's interesting and dynamic about downtown Toronto is that really, you know, uh, neighborhoods change. So while, while we are in transition, I think uh, this is the opportunity for us as, an org as a community to think about what is the future uh, for the village and does it make sense for us any longer? For me, the questions are a lot more about what the village represents and what it offers to people, both who live there and, and who travel to there or who, you know, perhaps visit once a week or once a month or whatever the case. I think it means many th different things to many different people. But he's in Bad Times is here, the 519 is here, uh, lots of the a ASO organizations are here. So there's a real, uh, uh, sort of connection uh, within this neighborhood. So my name is Brendan Healy. I'm the artistic director of Buddies and Bad Times Theatre, which is the world's largest and oldest queer theatre, um, located in the heart of the gay village of Toronto. And um, we have programming all year round. We have a main stage season. We do mainly new plays. Uh, we're also a, a nightclub. So on the weekends, we, uh, we have drag performances. We have dancing. We have partying. Uh, we do comedy. We do quite, quite a wide variety of activities. Um, we're also an important uh, community space. So a lot of uh, organizations, service organizations ha have fundraisers here, have events here, and we sort of donate the space. So the 519 is a board of management of the City of Toronto, and we're a community centre located in downtown Toronto. And part of what we are uh, responsible to do is to help develop neighbourhoods, communities, provide programs and services that are relevant to the local neighbourhood. And part of that, what that does for us as, a, as an organization is we provide programs, because we're located in the heart of the LGBT village, that have a, a connection to the queer community. Well, I believe there are many reasons why um, spaces such as our own are really, really important in the world. Um, again, as, as LGBT people have gained rights, there's a kind of, there's a kind of maybe LGBT person uh, who, whose rights are, 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 have been celebrated, and it's usually middle class white guys. Um, but there's huge sections of our community that certainly don't see themselves uh, uh, in that, in that, in that person, uh, and I don't, you know, I think sort of, you know, transsexuals certainly have huge, huge obstacles. Uh, uh, 
uh, queer people of color still face incredible discrimination, even within our own community. Uh, we uh, run programs uh, for trans uh, youth and trans folks, uh, as well as uh, a Sunday drop-in for homeless folks who are, who are also queer and have experienced homelessness or under house. Um, and then we run a range of programs for LGBT queer refugees and newcomers. Um, and then we also provide public space. Um, and what we do in our public space is uh, we have over 80 community-led groups, and they run anything from rainbow ballroom dance dancing to AA groups to um, everything under the sun. Certainly the 519 Community Center continues to be crucial to loads of communities in this city and I'm, I'm grateful for it and would support it in any way I can. I think the 519, as long as it's there, I think, you know, the gayborhood will continue to be important. So about a year ago, we secured some funding from uh, TD Bank uh, to help uh, sponsor this project. The whole purpose of the project is actually to look at the future of the LGBT village. Uh, it doesn't make sense uh, any longer, given the fact that m many places across Toronto are much more open and accessible and accepting uh, to queer folk. Um, and it was also to help us think about what's the presence of the LGBT community uh, in Toronto, especially leading into World Pride. We've, we contacted over 150 sort of key kind of community advisors. We did a survey with over 1,400 people as well. Uh, and what we heard overwhelmingly from the folks that we spoke to or, or you know, sort of responded to the surveys is that people actually have a connection to this neighborhood and they've had that connection whether it's through the early years of, of community advocacy or around same sex partner rights, uh, whether it's same sex marriage issues, then, um, or more recently because they're a newcomer uh, and they're new to the city and this is the first time that they've ever actually ever been in a space that's open and accepting and, and kind of visually queer friendly. There are still many people People. There are many places in the country and there's still many people even in the city of Toronto that um, don't necessarily feel or experience that level of acceptance in their own lives and in their own realities. And so having a village that is a safe space where they can go into, um, where they don't have to explain themselves because maybe the area or the location or the birth community into which they were born, that's not necessarily the, the response that they would get. So having, having queer defined space uh, for people to be able to come to, I think is really important. What we heard very clearly, um, especially for people who are in vulnerable communities or coming as, as newcomers uh, to, the, to, the, to the city, this is the first time many of them have ever actually ever been in a safe space. We have folks uh, leaving countries where it's actually illegal to be gay, you can be killed because you're gay, and this is really the first time when they come into the city of Toronto that they actually come to a neighborhood and a community that they really feel welcome and accepting, and it really is a touch touchdown place and they build community and from there they kind of are able then to be able to go out and and to go into the rest of the city of Toronto and, and to live comfortably and, and going forward. I don't want to say that I've never felt welcomed in the village because it definitely served a purpose when I was a teenager, a late teen and I needed somewhere to go and figure out what I was going through in my life. For me personally it's just not been my social hub but I do continue to think that the village is actually very important and certainly a touchstone for a lot of people who move to the city, a lot of people who are newly out, you know, people who come from other countries, other small towns. I came from a small town. It was, again, it was hugely important to me. So I think that uh, the village, whether you go out at night there or not, you know, I mean, I think it's important to know that there is a gay village. And I think that folks recognize that there's lots of places across Toronto that, again, that are that are open accepting, but there's something about this, this community and this neighborhood that it's about the roots, it's about the connections, it's about the history around uh, advocacy that really still resonate with lots of folks. And that um, even if it's a matter of coming back once a year, people still feel that this is kind of that home base. Um, and that's why I think in many ways for the community members who don't have have um, the privilege or perhaps the opportunity of stepping out of the closet, there will always be sanctuary and home in having a very visible, a very uh, powerful and prominent space to call their own, which is the village.
couple of things that, that are interesting, certainly from my perspective, is, is this kind of concept around the development of a sort of church street charter. And it really is about uh, the community coming together, whether again through local businesses, local residents, neighborhood associations, and community-based organizations, to uh, embrace a charter which is about a long-term commitment to ensuring the long-term viability of this neighborhood. And, uh, and when you know that there's an opportunity for world pride coming, I think there's a real um, uh, it would be a real mistake for us not to harness our collaborative energies and think of ways to really use that opportunity as an economic catalyst for the neighborhood to improve the vitality for the business owners, to improve the quality of life for the residents who are living there. Part of the ways I think of doing that is, is animating the space differently and animating Church Street differently. And I think you can see the Parklets initiative is one of the examples that with the support of the local uh, Councillor Wong Tam. Which you now see uh, on Church Street. Uh, it's a very first time in the city of Toronto that we've introduced parklets and parklets are simply a way of us taking over where a, a car would have been parked, so a parking space, and we turned it over to public use. You know there's lots of examples I think internationally about when you animate spaces and, and streetscaping differently uh, and create more vibrant look and feel to the neighborhoods then folks start to come back and start to feel connected again and so um, one of the other recommendations is actually beginning to think very strategically how do we do that? The queer community could advocate advocate um, more from City Hall in terms of recognition of this this particular neighborhood as being actually of historical significance. I think I'd love to see a, a village that acknowledged its history. Having physical markers and having uh, physical spaces along the village, the monuments, the statues, whatever, I think that's really, really important. Um, another very exciting project for us is called a Church Street Mural Project. Um, and it literally is being promoted as an outdoor art gallery. Um, and it's going to uh, promote 12 mural artists who are going to paint and uh, construct and build and execute 12 murals for us. These murals have been um, uh, commissioned specifically for the theme of LGBT liberation, of uh, gay rights equality, and the history of the village. The way we brought the process forward was we actually brought out elders, so we call them pioneers now, um, but people who have come before us, uh, a generation before who led the wave and paved the way for equality rights. Those who were actually storming through the legislative assembly when we were trying to get Bill 7 across. Those who fought for us all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada advocating for uh, marriage equality rights. They came out. And, um, and, and there were like 50 of them, uh, these pioneers, elders. And they shared the story of the LGBT struggle and the process of advocacy with the artists who are LGBT identified. And they, they basically uh, convey to the artists um, what, was, what was it like to be arrested? What was it like during the 1981 bathhouse raids? Um, and those artists then went away with those stories and they gave visualization to those stories and that's the commission artwork that will be placed on those walls. And we think that it's a way of, number one, uh, rebranding the community. So if there's any question about whether or not Church and Wellesley needs to exist or whether or not the LGBT community has a place in that neighborhood, that's one way of saying yes we do in a very loud, splashy, colorful way. All our projects right now in the Church and Wellesley catchment area are all uh, lined up and, uh, and to be unveiled uh, as World Pride legacy projects. Um, it's very important to note that much of it is being driven from our office locally in collaboration with our community partners. Uh, we haven't seen the level of cooperation from the city yet, um, which is a real shame and I think this is something where we have to be mindful of in terms of speaking about what it means to be LGBT and how do we access government services and, and public resources. So for example, the Pan American Games is coming to Toronto in 2015. We know that there's billions of dollars of infrastructure that we built for the Pan American Games, uh, facilities, athletic venues, and what have you. That's all legacy through the Pan Am Games. The city is behind it, so is the province, and so is the federal government. Billions of dollars are at stake. World Pride is an event that's being held in the city of Toronto, um, and yet the city of Toronto has not stepped up 
in the way that I would like to see them step up in terms of advocating for this community, putting it onto the city agenda, making sure that there's banners flying everywhere to let people know, the residents as well as visitors to Toronto, that World Pride is top of mind for the city and that the city champions LGBT equality. With her involved in the revitalization, that's an important element for sure. Having a, a queer counselor there matters a lot. And uh, hopefully we'll continue to see little projects that, you know, spiff up the village a bit, because I think we all know that it could use some spiffing up, <laughs> you know, it just could. And uh, though it, it is far from being exclusively gay businesses at this time, and really it never has been, um, I think to celebrate what is there um, is important. I also think that being a gay business is not enough to bring you business anymore, where maybe in the past it was. I've often, for example, complained about the restaurants and the food at the restaurants, but again, it's a niche market. Um, and so there are businesses that assume that they will have business no matter what the quality of their product is. And I think that's a little bit problematic. I think that has to shift. So I think that we see businesses on Church Street and beyond um, having to think a bit more about what they offer in addition to being queer owned. Uh, but also it actually means that those who work in the village will have to elevate their game because the expectations are that much greater. You know, change is controversial no matter where you see it or how it's expressed. You know, people will always like the change and people will always resist it. And I think that um, the village, I think unlike many neighborhoods, is multi-generational um, in a very, in a sort of active intermingling way. Unlike any like bar scene that I've ever been in, you have 20-year-olds in the same room as 50-year-olds, and everyone seems to get along with it. And I think that's that's unusual for most neighborhoods. Um, but I think that if you look at that as a spectrum, you definitely have younger people walking away from the village at the same time as the older people are sort of fighting the changes that would be necessary to retain them. And I think that our business is definitely sort of caught in the middle of that between a generation that that wants us to be what we were and a group of people that's quite happy with what we've become. One of the questions I get asked a lot is whether or not I feel differently. I don't know that I even felt a certain way to begin with. I was just unpacking these experiences and trying to understand um, how should a person be in the city as a young gay teen, as a young adult, um, and what do the spaces that we occupy say about us? Do we need to be in a certain zone or neighborhood? No. Is it important? Sure. You know, Church and Wellesley will always be the heart of the LGBT community, I think, in Toronto. And in, in many cases, the identity of LGBT-ness in Canada because of the historical context, um, because of the fact that we've clustered together and built these neighborhoods together. We've, we've, we've built our businesses side by side. We came together with the idea of saving this part of queer history and sort of continuing to grow it as a community-focused business. Right? Sure, in 2013 style still. So we're stepping in with, I think, different ideas, maybe newer ideas, um, also with the internet and the online store. And the bookstore also has a, a, an additional floor that's an mm -hmm. event space. So that space is rentable and is available to community, individuals, to whoever, to, to rent. It's a community space, and that's part of how we're also trying to build or give back to the community. So professionally working in the village for most of my life here in Toronto, uh, I've, it's been the same deal the whole time. Bars come, bars go, they open, they close, people leave, there's controversy, there's whatever. There's, it's, it's flowing and growing and shrinking all the time. And I don't think that just because Queen West is really popular and some people are staying out here and don't feel a need to go to the village, that it's necessarily dying. Uh, you can go any day this week in the village and every patio is packed, every bar is filled. It took maybe eight months before people stopped asking me if we were open yet. Which was always to me sort of like, a, yeah, one of those sort of just like aggravating moments where it's like, yes, we've been open for eight months. Like we're, we're open, we have a, we're, we're very busy. We've been busy for eight months. There is a, you know, sort of young 
male gay privilege of the idea of being over gay, and I think that um, that's completely wrong. Being a white male in an urban center, not everyone has the privilege that we do. Um, something that I've come to examine and recognize a lot more. It's amazing to live in a city where church exists and the West End exists. So we finally got Willem in, and we were worried if it was gonna be as busy, what was gonna happen, but it turned out to be just as great, and it was a really great show. Everybody loved it, we got great feedback. Willem had a great time. She says that she can't wait to come back, so that's a good sign. And um, we, we got it done, we got it done, and I was really happy, our first Pride. Um, it was a little bit of a hiccup, but I think in the end it benefited us, and we were able to show people and show our clientele that, you know, we are here to stay, we mean business, we want you guys to have a good time. It's the kind of turnover that I think a healthy community has. I think it would be an unhealthy situation if, if you were only seeing businesses close, but I think part of the study that the 509 is undertaking has also recognized that there's a number of, of, of new business entrants, and some of them have had rougher starts. Um, but I think definitely there's a generation of, of, of business owners and community leaders who are, who are actively pursuing modernizing and changing and, and, and enhancing what we have as a village in, in, a, in the kind of progressive way that's healthy for all communities. I do think it's important that we support the village. Uh, even though it's not my scene, I've never felt particularly welcome, but um, it's important to have a heart and I, I really believe in the relevance and the importance of queer neighborhoods. That's not to say that queer people can't live in other neighborhoods. It's not, that's not what it means. But it means that there's an area where my culture, my history, and people who are like me can come and find each other. And uh, the church in Wellesley Village is recognized, I would say, throughout the LGBT uh, world. Uh, globally, it's seen as the center of the LGBT heart in Canada, and uh, and after World Pride, it will be even more solidified uh, as our reputation as a place of acceptance and tolerance. Perhaps World Pride being here will help us think about what we're lucky to have in the city, and hopefully dream a little bit about what we could have and, and what we could offer to queer youth coming up and all that sort of stuff. And it's not just about some fancy markers at the beginning and the end of our village on Church Street, but I think anything that has people kind of explore our history and look to our future and to have these kinds of discussions together is important. What's exciting for me about this project is it's a whole whack of community folks coming together and having a conversation really animated, really committed, really interested, uh, and really passionate about the future of this neighborhood. And I think once you have that kind of atmosphere and environment, lots of things can happen that are really positive for the, for the city and, and for the community. So really, we're incredibly fortunate, and we need to consider ourselves really fortunate. And you know, and I think that it's, it's wonderful that we can coexist um, in a city where something like Church Street exists, and then these great Hip hop parties in the West End exist, and um, and that everyone has something for themselves and, and a place where they feel safe and uh, they feel comfortable and they feel like they can express themselves. And I know that there is some desire to do a big, ambitious street programming for Church Street. Uh, what the design will look like, uh, who will make it happen, uh, who will construct it, who will be our designer. Those questions are still uh, yet to be answered, but the one thing I am very confident about is that this is an, uh, a community that will have a plethora of opinions and there'll be no shortage of idea, passion and energy. And I'm very excited for those, uh, those conversations.